Hello. Oughts and ises. Oughts are normative statements, ises are descriptive statements. Hume's law would like us to believe that the uh, that oughts and ises are separate, different. In his essay, he talked about how a lot of moral philosophers are going to write a paper where it's like is, 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 and then ought, and boom, and ought shows up out of nowhere and uh, makes no sense. How does it logically follow from the ises? That's what uh, Hume would ask. And then at the end, he says, well, you know, given this trend, we should probably steer clear of doing this in hopes that this would... Uh, uh, mo <laughs> in hopes that this would motivate us away from any vulgar systems of morality. Although he is right that vulgar systems of morality do tend to be the ones to violate Hume's law, I think that Hume's law has a flaw. Hume's flaw. Rather, I don't think that uh, oughts and ises are as epistemologically distinct as he'd like us to believe, as, as we'd like to believe. In fact, they're not that epistemologically distinct at all. They're perhaps ontologically distinct in some sense, but after all, those are two different kinds of statements. You know, you have an is, which is a description of how the world currently is, or was, or will be, and uh, well, and given that the present is sort of an infinitesimal, it's more so a description of how the world was or will be. Uh, and a normative statement is a statement about how the world should be, how the world, you know, how, how we would prefer the world to be. The uh, states in which the world that we ought to seek, we ought to gravitate towards, and uh, states of the world we sh ought to avoid. You know, th there's no real way to deconstruct the, the, uh, th them ontologically uh, beyond that, but I don't think that they're that different. Um, namely, the tenet here is that every statement uh, anymore, every statement is essentially an ought and an is loaded up in one. Every statement of fact or every moral suggestion. Uh, anytime I speak to you, er every interaction between humans, even every action, uh, there doesn't even have to be interaction, entails an ought and an is, or rather ought is equivalence. So it's a little weird to say that, well, you know, to, to call upon Hume's law and, and walk in here and say, well, I'm just talking about is is. I'm not telling you how, what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. Well, see, that's a lie. You are. You are saying exactly that. You know, you, you say that just by acting the way that you do and, and expecting certain responses. You know, j just by trying to get something out of me, you are entailing moral standards as well as truth standards. So let me just get into this. This is not going to be complicated. It's, um, some of you might already see how uh, every ought is also an is. Every ought entails an is. Um, to see this, you know, just you could just imagine that an ought is really just an is, in the sense that it is a preference statement from the subject, from the subject's perspective. You know, so if I say killing is wrong, you can, in the very least, say it is true that I think killing is wrong. So that there are, uh, and that that is. You know, the idea of killing being wrong, of killing being morally sort of non-preferable is something, is a standard that I will put forward and uh, try to enforce onto the world just by believing it, right? And there is an is in there. You know, there's also an is that, all, honestly, odd statements are all predicated on is is anyway. You know, if I, if I, uh, you know, let's say that I'm, uh, I'm talking about you killing someone, I'm saying you killed him, that... Right, that entails physical things happening and truths, and and the, the the truth or falsehood of the things I'm describing being themselves true. In other words, as I've said before, you know you have to have some sort of standard for truth before you can begin to analyze morality. Because in order to in order to make a normative judgment, you need to you know you, you need to agree on what the states are before you can begin to weigh them morally as good and bad states. 
uh, respectively, like the, the the is component of every ought statement is sort of just implicit. It, it's everywhere. If I say that you know, if if a rabbit is jumping into a snare, and I talk about how well that's bad for the rabbit, you know, there is an implicit, uh, you know, that's an ought statement that I'm making. But there's an implicit is statement there, uh, referring to the the psychological normative characteristics of, of the rabbit. The rabbit doesn't want to jump into the snare. There, there's this just implicit idea of there being such a thing as the rabbit's best interest, the, the rabbit's sort of preferred state of being, and the rabbit is not going towards that state of being by jumping into the snare. You know, and, and then the, the, this applies pretty much all the time. Every single time we talk about oughts, we are also talking about ises. We're always uh, making claims like, uh, you know, you shouldn't kill, or you shouldn't do this, or you, you know, you, you shouldn't do X as opposed to Y. All of that is predicated on certain physical, real characteristics of X and Y, and also predicated on the idea that X and Y are something that are objectively preferable to one person or another, or the speaker, right? All of which are ises. Um, so, the point is, the point is, every ought also entails an is. Every ought is predicated by an is, every ought carries an is with it. And the same thing goes in reverse. Every is also entails an ought. Every is entails some sort of normative standard. The reason why is clear. Truth itself is a normative standard. If I go and tell you the sky is blue, I'm not just telling you what's true, I'm also telling you what you should believe. You know, if you're not going to believe that the sky is blue when I tell you it is, and when I prove to you that it is, you're an idiot, right? You know, if I'm going to sit there and argue to you that something is true or something is false, then that implicitly suggests a normative preference of truth over falsehood. Right. It also suggests a normative preference on my standard for truth over your standard for truth. Or it suggests that my standard for truth is better, or, or that I don't have, uh, ig this, or maybe we have the same standard for truth, but I am less ignorant than you, and therefore it suggests a preference of knowledge over ignorance. So no matter what is statement I make, I'm always normatively uh, putting forth um, I'm always norm normatively putting forth uh, epistemological truth standards. And given that I'm always going to be doing that, and I can't sort of non-arbitrarily suggest which truth standard is you know, better than any other uh, on, on sort of a, a grounded level, then it just boils down to me just saying, this here truth standard is better, you should follow this one as opposed to this one, and me hoping that you're going to agree, and in the hopes that every single person pretty much agrees on what can be true and what isn't true. Uh, hence why we all agree on what's true and false in science and mathematics, for the most part. Yeah, so is's entail oughts, oughts entail is's, that means every statement carries both an ought and an is. So Hume's law is essentially uh, sort of on a, on, a, on a base level, it's completely useless because it tells you nothing about what's happening. Really, you're, you're always making ought and is statements. It's not true Right, that that a moral philosopher is going to go is 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 ought, you know. There, um, I mean, there is a sort of a, a distinction between the two statements, but it's not technically true that they weren't making ought statements before, and then they got to a point in the paper where they started making ought statements. You know, they were making ought statements the entire time. They just started making stronger ought statements later on, and maybe those don't logically follow from the previous parts of the paper, but technically speaking, technically speaking, they're making ought and is statements the entire time. <sighs> the point is, epistemologically, uh, ought and is statements are intertwined, just like formal deductive logic and inductive logic are intertwined. It, just like mathematics and science are intertwined. You can't really separate one from the other. They're just, they're intermingled and intermeshed everywhere. You're always being normative, you're always being you're always sort of um, putting forth normative standards, which is why I immediately don't trust people when they say that it's like, I'm not telling you what to do. Ugh. 
you, you accept you are. You are by your behavior and by your preference of one type of uh, standard over another. And your suggestion that there's something wrong with me for not following standard X over standard Y. It's the same thing. That's why I don't even believe that there is such thing as a libertarian. Everyone's putting forward their normative standard, no matter what they do. Uh, everyone's, morally speaking, an authoritarian in that sense. But yeah, ontologically there may be a difference between sort of the, the world of descriptive truths and the world of normative truths, or yeah, the world of normative truths, the world of descriptive truths, but um, ontologically it's not that important. We don't really talk about what's ontologically true. We can't. It's the world outside of Plato's cave. It's the objectively, inherently objective stuff that's inaccessible by the human brain. You know, and uh, I mean, if you're going to say that morality ontologically is separate from reality, well, sure, that's true, but then you could say the same thing about mathematics. Mathematics is ontologically distinct from science and reality, so even though it still, too, is sort of intertwined within the, the fabric of reality. You know, mathematical rules describe reality, but math itself is not ontologically grounded in reality. You don't see numbers, you don't see any of that stuff, it's just a formalism. And yet, there is the, the whole thing about you know mathematical realism, where it's like math is actually a thing that exists in it like its own universe, and I kind of like that view. And the same thing about morality, right? And the same thing with ethics. Ethics too, like mathematics, exists in its own universe, in its own abstract universe, where there are truths and falsehoods, and there are sort of correct foundations and incorrect foundations. Uh, that's what I'd uh, that that's that's the. I'll just say what's motivating uh, my whole perspective here is that exact uh, uh, view, is that in terms of foundation, there's no real difference. And uh, just seeing where ethics applies in the real world, it really feels as if it, uh, it, it really feels as if it's, it's just as key as something like mathematics to describing, not necessarily describing reality, but describing what human beings ought to do in reality. So yeah. There's one thing more. And there's also some point as to saying things like, you know, is this morally correct? Is this morally good? You know, there's an is statement there, right? This is morally good, right? This is morally good just means this ought to be something people do, right? And uh, this is true in reality just means this ought to be something people believe, right? right? And this ought to be true is just saying that this can be true and this should be true and that there are that there is the way human preference work is that this is something that is preferred. The, the whole point is just I haven't like fully grounded this whole thing but I mean I'm just saying it's 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 pretty clear on the onset that the 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 statements oughts and is is are non are non they're not mutually exclusive they apply all the time you can't really separate them um, however I will say just in the party note I think Hume's law is still useful but it's useful in the same sense that human laws in uh, today's society are useful in that they are guidelines they are not moral bedrock so to speak they are not the bedrock of the technical truth of what's happening in the world and what's happening normatively. They are simple guidelines that we can use to dismiss certain moralities in the onset. For example, if I say, you know, well, evolutionarily speaking, there are strong people and there are weak people, and this is all, this is an is, and then I could say, and because of this, the, the strong should eat the weak, and then the human race becomes stronger. Uh, and that's the odd, right? That is a good place to call upon Hume's law and say, wait a second, are you sure that, that the latter follows from the former? I would say that you can perhaps derive certain normative truths from reality, but not in the way of the social Darwinist example I just gave. And then it just doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. It just, you, you, you pulled it out of your ass halfway through the, the paper for, <laughs> you know, for no reason, for some biased motivator that you have in your head. It, it doesn't actually follow from anything in reality. It's just, it's just you, right? Hume's law can be good at weeding out stuff like that, but it's not a technical truism of uh, the epistemological difference between 
normativity and descriptivity. Anyway, that's it. Cheers.